Hello, welcome to our next reading group for Ona Narent. My name is Giulia Antonioli and I'm content creator at the Richard Salton Gallery in London. Today's event is organized in connection with the gallery's year-long series of exhibitions inspired by Arendt's 1968 publication Between Past and Future. Our discussion will focus on Arendt's fifth essay entitled The Crisis in Education. And The Crisis in, in Education is also the title of our current exhibition featuring Eleanor Antin and Sean Davy which continues in London until 18th of September. We have developed these virtual reading group sessions to explore Arendt's writings in more depth and have done so in partnership with the Anne Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. Our sessions are actually modeled off of the center's own official virtual reading group, which I encourage you to have a look at. You can find out more on the Anaren Center's website and social media channels. I thank all the panelists who have joined us, an exciting mix of scholars, artists, and other creatives. And I will now introduce today's special guest, Griselda Pollock. So art historian and feminist cultural theorist Griselda Pollock is professor of social and critical histories of art at the University of Leeds known for her long-standing work reshaping art history to acknowledge the creativity of women and artists from across all cultures. Her major books include All Mistresses, Women, Art and Ideology and Vision and uh, Difference, amongst others. And a special mention and connection to Anna Arendt is her uh, research program at the university that ran from 2007 onwards that's called uh, Concentrationary Memories that led to four publications, Concentrationary Memories, Concentrationary Cinema, Concentrationary Imageries, and Concentrationary Art. And she most recently completed two monographs, Charlotte Salomon and the Theatre of Memory. And then recently she has been awarded the renowned Holberg Prize in 2020. So thank you, Griselda, for joining us tonight. I will now hand over to Roger Berkowitz, founder and director of the Anna Arendt Center. So Roger, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. This has been a, a wonderful series um, that the uh, Saltoon Gallery has put together, um, both artistically and also as a way of exploring together the works of Hannah Arendt and her book, Between Past and Future. Um, one of my favorite books of hers because it's a, a series of essays that are exercises in thinking. And uh, this year long reading group that we've been engaging in has been a wonderful exercise in thinking um, with the artists and creatives that are, are with us. So I wanna thank them and all of you who are joining in, uh, especially um, Rosetta de Pollock who has told us that this is one of her favorite essays of Arendt. Uh, I agree, it's, it's one I, I teach a fair bit and always uh, turn to. So I'm very excited to see her presentation on the crisis in education. And um, then we will uh, have a little conversation. We'll bring in the panelists and then bring in questions from the webinar and we look forward to it. So Griselda, I hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you all of the listening people out there. Now I'm exceptionally fortunate to have been invited to, at this point in this series. The baffling complexity of Hannah Arendt's eight exercises in political thought between past and future, offering her lengthy analyses of classical political theories of tradition, history, authority, and freedom, finally become intelligible as we think about the two central chapters of the book on crisis, the crisis in education and the crisis in culture, both of which she deems to be of a political order. Both the theory of crisis and the centrality of education in crisis will need to be explained. Now, the key to understanding uh, the book Between Past and Future is always to read the final paragraph of each essay first, which effectively condenses the argument the preceding chapter has laid out, often without signposting the journey to this point. We will come to this chapter's final paragraph momentarily, but first let us read together the conclusion to freedom, which is where we left off last week, last time we met. Objectively, that is, she writes, and without taking into account that man is a beginning and a beginner, the chances that tomorrow will be like yesterday are always overwhelming. Not quite so overwhelming to be sure, but very nearly so 
as the chances that there uh, that were that there would be no earth would ever arise out of cosmic occurrences that no life would have developed out of organic processes that no man would have emerged out of the evolution of animal life the decisive difference between infinite probabilities on which the realities of our earthly life rests and the miraculous character inherent in those events which establish historical reality is that in the realm of human affairs, we know the author of the miracles. It is men, in our vocabulary, people who perform them. People who, because they have received the twofold gift of freedom and action, can establish a reality of their own. This seems to me huge in its implications. And I know we struggled last time I, we were together with freedom, but this seems to me the crucial thing. Freedom is the condition of action. Action is the event that instantiates freedom, which is basically creation. Both occur in the realm of human affairs, a chance occurrence, a miracle of the unexpected event of earthly life amongst infinite probabilities or even improbabilities. These actions establish what she calls historical reality. Already much is condensed from the preceding chapters and anticipates the final chapter on earthliness when she condemns the fantasy of space travel. This passage also sets our stage for understanding the central position allocated to education in what we must understand as Arendt's post-totalitarian thinking, where the latter, totalitarianism, is the unexpected rupture in historical reality that left those in its wake without um, the what she names in the preface, preface as our treasure. We are somehow isolated or cut off from what was the treasure that enabled us to plot our ways through time. For what happened in the mid 20th century had as yet no name, had no yet no remembrance. And those of us involved in the creation of cultural memory and the whole debates about the event at the limits of representation already understand what she's talking about. Totalitarianism is the name for our inheritance that was given to us without a testament. We don't have someone who willed it to us. Something for us in a time of writing in the 1950s to wrestle into naming and totalitarianism was Arendt's naming for this event. Now, secondly, freedom and action are linked and create for us the realm of the political as the space of our coming together to do something, possibly something new, only new in the sense of the unforeseen, not in the sense of the merely novel. That is, we make and remake the common world and make historical reality a kind of a dynamic. We need this final of the four founding concepts, uh, freedom, um, we, we need the founding, we need freedom, which is the final of the four founding concepts of these first four essays, because they lay out tradition, history, authority, and freedom as the conditions on which we can then think the nature of this new. Okay, they will be put to work because in the modern age, we are now in crisis, inheriting this test, this un testamentary inheritance. It is a crisis of modern historical reality. So let me talk about crisis. The crisis she introduces in the preface is anticipated in Kafka's writing as a gap. It's a gap between the parallelogram of forces of past and future that we're sort of caught between these. And that we have, we have produced ideas about um, which me sorry jumping ahead so this gap is between the space is is a speak of between a kind of space of suspension or rather as she says an out of time space where thinking not action must first take place so in the preface she calls the the present as it were this gap a non time space at the very heart of time which unlike the world and the culture into which we are born can only be indicated but cannot be inherited or passed down from the past each new generation each new human being as she inserts herself between an infinite past and an infinite future must discover and ploddingly pave it anew so this is a kind of obligation not an inheritance now 
Arendt is challenging the typical notions of time by reminding us that we live and die, that we overlap in generations, that we have produced ideas about what persists, links what gets passed on. But there is also this fact of natality, because natality initiates constantly new beginnings through new people coming to join us. We arrive into an existing world, an existing world, however, that for a time is a shared world with people of a whole different moments of becoming. In that existing world, people have been thinking and formulating and even institutionalizing forms of continuity, forms of tradition. They have dreamed of immortality and they have engendered formally what we would now call memory, but what the classical thinkers called history, a record of attempts to defeat mortality through creating deeds which would be immortal through being remembered. And that's this where this place of tradition and memory and history overlap. So in order to grasp the centrality of the two chapters on crisis and hence the logic of what has preceded them, I need first to position this book between past and future itself. I see it as the third of the trilogy, the, the totalitarian trilogy, which begins with the origins of totalitarianism, study of the most anti-political event of the 20th century, at whose heart she discovered via the experimental um, elimination or experimental abolition. So she discovered as a result of that experimental abolition of it, the thing she called the human condition, which is volume two. And the human condition arises, as we know, between notality, this capacity for newness, hence change or transformation, hence creation and innovation, and the other facet of natality, which is plurality. It, uh, natality engenders both singularity, a new one, and also a variety of new ones that becomes, and these two terms become the conditions for thinking or building what Arendt will consider to be participatory democracy, a concept that we have to invent that exceeds existing so-called democratic social systems, as well as their radical abolition by their antithesis, which was totalitarianism, an event which mirrored modernity's failures to itself. Between past and future is therefore the logical successor to these two major works of grounded political analysis that now turns to these exercises in political thought to rethink the terms of rejecting both conservatism, the preservation of an ideal past through mindless loyalty, in some sense a platonic idea, and revolution as the invention of a once and for all radically new that replaces the past. On the way, she has also punctured enlightenment delusions of progress and human perfectibility, calling them self-serving timeless extensions of the notion of revolution that allows for no future change. Between past and future therefore creates or points to a non-time space to be discovered. The future is not anyone's generation's project because the fact is the newcomers arrive in an existing and already made world that they have to share. They also, however, arrive in conditions that are already going to shape their realm of action. They are not fated by their situation. They are not entirely predetermined, but they cannot fully act without knowledge of the past, a past that does not have authority, as traditionalists might claim, but it has value if it is transmitted because it gains scope for understanding the realm of possible action. To act in our end's terms requires us to be able to think. Hence, the fourth chapter of this trilogy is Eichmann. We might understand that the present as a space of cross temporalities that is also the site of encounters within overlapping historical temporalities. The encounter is not merely of two generations, but of a sense of both a common world and of other possibilities unforeseen, but not predetermined by the sheer fact of there being newcomers at all. Newcomers may not renew the world, or they may not be very new in their thinking at all. They may be utterly burdened by or trapped in, and in Fanon's famous phrase, weary of a past that has not yet been transformed. 
racism, class relations, imperialist worlding, patriarchies, heterocracies are historical burdens for those they mark, and they pervert those who benefit from their crude injustices and inhumanities. This is why education becomes this singularly significant political space for Arendt, not as a space of political indoctrination, left or right, but in its very condition of encounter between the once new who've been around a while and the now living bearers who are now the living bearers of worlds of their own and of the past and its historical realities, who are meeting the newcomers who must not be left alone to their own devices if they are to be enabled to renew the common world in and for their own newcomers. The crisis is the effect of totalitarianism because the latter represented this anti-political event that challenged Arendt to reconfigure herself as a political theorist because the polis, the, polis, the political, the common world, what she understood therefore to be the human made world as opposed to the natural world, had been potentially destroyed by the experiments in total domination. We cannot read between past and present without our grounding in the discoveries of writing both the origins of totalitarianism and the uh, human condition. In fact, the essay we consider tonight, um, um, so I say, it is, it is in fact in the essay we consider tonight that the purposes of her historical revisiting of the classical pol political theories in the first four essays finally become relevant. She turns to them not as canonical texts, but as the remnants of the struggle with the political before the potential abolition of the political by totalitarianism. And even though totalitarianism already is revealed to have its long history in various other processes of modernization, like imperialism, that she also revealed to have been ultimately destructive, not only of human in the sense of the inhumanity of enslavement and, and colonialism, but also of the political. This is, of course, her critique of Marx, who fostered a focus on social relations determined by economic structures, rendering, as he brilliantly showed in the 18th Brumaire, the political as merely a staging, a theater of the interests of finance, agrarian and industrial capital, or the battle between those, and we who live in neoliberal capitalism know which capitalism won the battle. The crisis in education as text and condition cannot be read without Arendt's complex and dense examination of these terms, tradition, authority, freedom, and history, because they are the resources by which we can begin now to discern the shape of the crisis that we are in. I imagine in Arendt's imaginative and thinking world posed between her study of the break the event that ruptured human political history and thought, Stalinism and genocidal fascism, and the um, rooted in imperial racism and the legacies of the French and American revolution. Now, all of you know this, but to me, it came as a, a re realization that this is the structure. The two concepts that converge in the crisis in education essay are world and the new, or rather natality. This of course signifies for Arendt not being physically born, but coming for standing for the potential of newness for change. For instance, because we are historical beings, we're not just animal life, we're not just evolving, we can change. Birth involves the capacity also for what I would call difference. She called it newness, and I think that's an interesting discussion to have. We could name it also as people involved in art as creation. And in that sense, it will lead us to her critique of bourgeois culture and her attempt in the essay that will follow this to define what art is. That which has been both newly created and is capable of creating meaning or experience that continues outside of its own time. The, the sense of art as opposed to culture that you consume is the non-consumable, which is that which can persist. Now, what has been created could attract a kind of fidelity to foundational institution. Um, 
and in the earlier discussions, you, one of the interesting things is between, as it were, the, the Platonic idea of, say, we come up with an ideal and you have to stick to it, and the Roman idea, which is that you found something and then you have to be faithful to it, which is exactly what happens in the United States. The United States is a Rome because every day, every child in every place in America has to stand up and, alleg and, and swear allegiance to the foundation of the Republic, which has to be refounded in that form every day. Whereas in Britain, of course, as Peter Morgan has shown, people who live in Britain are subjects of a crown, whether you wear it, serve it, or live under it. It is this impersonal persistence that traps everyone in an imaginative world of a kind of a system, whether it's perfect or not. So if we start from the premise that the radical destruction of the polis and with it history affected by totalitarianism was the trauma for political thinkers, that Arendt was addressing, we can see why at the heart of this series of political exercises we're reading together, we have to come to education. Now, there are two other elements to put in place before we think fully about education, if you can bear with me, which is belatedness, which is not only does the newcomers, natality create the, the newcomers, they always come belatedly because something is already there. And the question is, I mean, for, we take something like Homi Baba thinking about the post-colonial framework, the capacity for newness and transformation, at, transformative action is limited by racial configurations of a colonial past that haunts the human future. And this is a formulation offered by Natasha Levinson in her book, the Para, uh, essay, The Paradox of Natality, Teaching in the Midst of Belatedness, which appears in a very interesting book called Hannah on Education that I recommend, I'll show it at the end. So if the wearisome weight of dehumanizing past threatens to depress us, the other danger, which also lurks, is forgetfulness, because we might then think, oh, I just can't bear it, let me escape from this perpetual sense of the doomedness of our, our inherited past. And forgetfulness is at work when we try to think post-racist, post-sexist space, or any other post-colonial space, without really acknowledging the articulations of racist, sexist, colonial articulations that still exist. So we're kind of caught in a, a double movement of being belated because we inherit something that we hate to know about, but in fact, we are trapped in it. And this causes uh, us to think about how could we educate in that context. So um, freedom then becomes the activation of the potentiality of natality as we maneuver between belatedness and forgetfulness because even as we arrive in predetermining histories these are not our fates we cannot forget them if we are to think and act beyond them and their powerful pre-framing we cannot invent the new without an understanding of history reconfigured in these terms so let me leap now from what was going wrong in US American education in the wake of post Dewey pedagogical theory. Let me go into what she's really criticizing. She is arguing that child or student centered educational practice is an anti democratic crime. That's, I think, is the heart of this book, this chapter. Why? She argues that this new model of centering education on a child's learning disempowers the newcomers from action by giving them too limited an intellectual training in thinking and too limited an access to the complexity of the things they need to think about and with, as well as the experience of models of other people thinking. Child or student-centered learning infantilizes both child and young person by focusing on learning as an activity without equally balancing it with teaching substantial resources for understanding. Socially, this model of education also, she argues, isolates children and young people in their own cohort, placing them at the Orwellian mercy of the tyranny of the majority, which we all know so well from our agonized viewings of great Hollywood movies about American high schools, apart from Buffy, which I think is quite cheering, and indeed perhaps Gilmore Girls is quite cheering, but I'm thinking basically of Car Carrie. Having passed through several different colonial North American and European education systems, I can truly testify to the trauma of that tyranny, each enacted in its different way and at whose heart is always anti-intellectualism. Now, 
Arendt's parallel concept of, is, of the role of teachers is as odds with the climate in which I'm sure we are all now required to operate professionally, where our universities themselves have taken up this model and require us to be interesting, exciting, caring, responsible, never difficult, never shattering, never extraordinary, except we are obliged in a sense to be constantly assessed in our performance by this majority um, of students based on student-centered thinking. So it might sound as if Arendt was an old-fashioned chalk and talk teacher, which is both too crude and too specific for the level at which her critique of modern pedagogy is being posed. It is a profoundly political analysis and a search for the grounds of both the political and participatorily democratic transformative education. She's arguing that modern pe pedagogy disempowers disempowers the new one, the child, disconnects the newcomers from created worlds, all under a destructive rubric of pseudo-democratization and pseudo-empowerment, which in effect estranges the newcomers from the world they inherit and they may seek to transform. Modern education can only then serve the status quo while appearing to proffer a fake liberalization with the focus on active learning that in fact becomes substance less. Um, so now we actually do come to the final chapter paragraph of crisis in education, uh, and I will stop very soon. What concerns us all, she writes, and cannot therefore be turned over to the special science of pedagogy, is the relation between grown-ups and children in general. Or putting it in even more general and exact terms, our attitude to the fact of natality. The fact that we have all come into the world by being born, and that this world is constantly renewed through birth. Education this is the great statement, is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough, this crucial idea of love for the world, to assume responsibility for it, not just to live in it, and by the same token, save it from that ruin, which except for renewal and except for the coming of the new and the young would be inevitable. And education too, this is the flip side, is where we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world and leave them to their own student-centered devices, nor to strike from their hands the chance of undertaking something new, something unforeseen by us, but to prepare them in advance for renewing a common world. This is a wonderfully kind of condensed and beautiful statement full of Arendtian complexity and concepts, Love of the world, responsibility for the world, saving the world from ruin is articulated in education only in so far as teaching is an act of love for the newcomers who need to share something of the world they have entered so they can forge the means to create, to surprise, while themselves understanding that they too will ultimately have to share the world they will make with new newcomers. It is in this sequencing that the common world becomes dynamic, becomes human because it is constantly being made. It is neither nature nor given, but a creation. If we then read some of the text backwards, we then find her saying before this final paragraph, one cannot educate without at the same time teaching. An education without learning is empty and therefore generates with great ease into a moral emotional rhetoric. But one can easily teach without educating. One can go on learning to the end of our days without becoming educated. All these partic are particulars that must be left to the experts and the pedagogues. Then we move back one further paragraph where we find her saying the problem of education in the modern world lies in the fact that by its very nature, it cannot forego either authority or tradition. Had we not read precedingly, we would have no idea why she's going to argue this, and yet must proceed in a world that is neither structured by authority nor held together by tradition. So having, as it were, both introduced them, deconstructed them, we now find them playing a role but not quite the same one that they themselves acquired prior to the totalitarian rupture. Um, 
this means that means that, however, not just teachers and educators, but all of us, insofar as we live in one world together with our children and young people, must take towards them, children and young people, an attitude radically different from the one we take towards one another. This seems to me incredibly complex idea, not just we can all be together and we share in a world which might be a misreading of what the common world means. We must also decisively divorce the realm of education from all others, most of all from the realm of public and political life, in order to apply to it alone the concept of authority and that attitude towards the past which are appropriate to it but have no general validity and must not claim a general validity in the world of grown-ups. So I hope this is kind of quite interesting, important debate. So we're not going to have student-centered learning. We're going to have some kind of um, vertical relation in which certain elements of traditional, the past and knowledge and authority are allowed to play, but not when they are dictated by indoctrination or public policies, or as we have in Britain, you know, um, curriculum set out by the university, by the, the governments. She then explains, um, I think we just had that one, I think it makes sense. Um, education is to teach children, this is not there, what the world is like, a world that is older than they, so the learning must turn towards the past. And yet, I'm commenting, if the past and authority of adequate knowledge to teach is significant, we must not create a line of separation between adults and children, even as we acknowledge the different places we occupy. Quote, there is a line between children and adults that should not become a wall of separation, but it will alter with respect to age and country and civilization. So we come finally to the question, if the authority and tradition exists, is she a conservative, a traditionalist, or not. So here, the final text I want to introduce is to avoid misunderstanding. Um, it seems to be that conservatism in the sense of conservation is of the essence of educational activity, whose task is always to cherish and protect something, the child against the world, the world against the child, the new against the old, the old against the new. Even the comprehensive responsibility for the world that is thereby assumed implies, of course, a conservative attitude. But this hold good, good, holds good only for the realm of education, or rather now for the relations between grown-ups and children within education, not for the realm of politics, where we act along and with adults and equals. In politics, this conservative attitude, which accepts the world as it is, striving only to preserve the status quo, can only lead to destruction because the world in gross and in detail is irrevocably delivered up to the ruin of time unless human beings are determined to intervene, to alter, to create what is new. So we go back to this sense of, a, of, of temporalities and the, 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 the present as a gap, a crisis, a gap, because something is that we don't know the shape of, which is a world post-totalitarianism, which we are still trying to figure out. And yet at the same time, there is this, this line that crosses this, this intervention into this space, which has its two points, the adults and the children, and a responsibility. But we cannot therefore allow the reasons that we might have authority and tradition as part of our thinking about what education is, it cannot be linked up to the conservative politics of conserving the status quo because we are then denying natality, denying that possibility of the new. And finally, um, we are always educating for a world that is or becoming out of joint because this is our basic human situation in which the world created by mortal hands to serve mortals for a limited time at home. Because the world is made by mortals, it wears out. 
because it continuously changes its inhabitants, it runs the risk of becoming as mortal as they. To preserve this world, this bigger world, against the mortality of its creators and inhabitants, it must be constantly set right anew. The problem is simply to educate in such a way that is setting right, that setting right remains actually possible, even so it can, of course, never be assured. Our hope always hangs on the new which every generation brings, but precisely because we can base our hope only on this, we destroy everything if we so try to control the new that way, the, the way that the old can dictate how it will look. Exactly for the sake of what is new and revolutionary in every child, education must be conservative. It must preserve this newness, introduce us as a new thing into an old world, which however revolutionary good actions may, may be, is always from the standpoint of the next generation, superannuated and close to um, destruction. So these are challenging propositions for contemporary educational practice and experience. What is critical is the separation of education from the political and public practice, which seems so alien to our currently intensely politicized educational spheres, where struggles over racism, white privilege, decolonization, sexuality, gender, are so exciting and intense. The radicalism of Arendt's conservatism lies in the creation in education, not of an acting out of all the brutalities of the world in which we are each bearers or perpetrators or victims, but the possibility of being different while sharing a common world whose crimes against humanity we can only transform through being, even if temporarily, in education, in that space, thinking together. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so this is a uh... This is a, a, an incredible uh, essay, and I really thank you um, uh, for your uh, for your reading of it. It's um, it's which was expansive and situated really uh, within the entire corpus of RN's work. Um, maybe maybe we begin um, just by trying to think through some of what you were talking about at the end. Um, this this. Uh, this need for Arendt to uh, conserve the world and yet also um, allow for the possibility of revolutionary or transformational change. The, the need to do justice to the world, to love the world, to take responsibility for the world. And as she says, and you said, she can't, you can't be a teacher or a parent you can't have responsibility for children unless you're going to take responsibility for the world and love the world. I think that's a, an important point. Um, you can't simply come to the world as an educator, as a critic. Um, you have to actually find something worth teaching in it. And on the other hand, that you also as a teacher have to prepare the students to change the world, to make the world better, to make the world different better, not in the sense that it will be objectively better, but change it as they will uh, for their idea of better. So, um, you know, we who are in education, right? You and I, and many on this call um, are confronted with this regularly. You know, 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, the big question was the canon, right? Do we teach the canon? Um, now it's decolonizing the curriculum. Um, I'm wondering, Griselda, how you think um, Arendt's work helps us think through some of these questions. Thank you, Roger. I mean, in, I think that's exactly what uh, makes this, this particular essay so um, contemporary. Um, one of the things that I, I didn't just say at the end, which is to do with the kind of um, uh, preoccupation of mine at the moment is the sense of how these very, very urgent issues of decolonization and deracialization and depatriarchalization, whatever we are, we are this, this kind of critical sense is operating, is that they, ha in one sense, in one platform of our present world, 
which is the social media platform, they are articulated through what I call Instagrammer. And in a kind of Derridian sense, I've articulated this notion to myself of a call for something called Instagrammatology. So this is not archaic old, you know, dinosaur saying, ooh, they talked about social media. It is actually crucially Arendtian to read that as a sort of uh, destruction of the complexity of language, of the sort of sentence structures, or even as we struggle to read Arendt, we, we, we see the, the, the arc of language that creates the possibility of thought. We read these texts, we have to come out with them. But at the moment, we are finding a kind of conflict between uh, a linguistic imaginatory and imaginary, imaginary world, or what I call concentrationary imaginaries, which are based on everything being a matter of uh, Manichaean oppositions between what is right and wrong, which is good is bad, which is, you know, to be cancelled or to be accepted, to be endorsed, to be liked. This isn't an individual thing about this generation in some, from an old point of view. It is a phenomenon which obviously encompasses the, the, the field and intrudes itself into the sphere of education in ways in which the calls for the transformation may well be betrayed precisely be, unless we can introduce this sense of um, a common world in which the possibility of our momentarily being together, even as we are the bearers of these different crimes and uh, oppressions and injuries, in an act of thinking together, right? So I think it seems to me that, that uh, the, the DDDD, I mean, I, 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 I did a talk recently about this sense of everything is, you know, D something uh, as if it, we know what the, the, the thing it was that like colonization, we don't know what it is. We have labels for it. We have statues that symbolize it. We have, uh, you know, signs of that stand for it rather than the kind of work that, for instance, she undertook with it, not everybody's going to do it, the origins of totalitarianism is not to, is to begin to piece together of what it's composed and how it holds together and what its effects are in order for us to, in a sense, think not in a kind of post-racist, post-colonial, you know, post-gender, as if those could go away, but in a sense of how we will undertake that transformation in a much more complex way. And I think that's my question about complexity and difficulty and what we learn when we share with students forms of complexity. So it's not the canon as a canonical exercise. So much of, for instance, in my, my own work to reconfigure what it is that artistic creation has been is to liberate it from art history's misinformation and disinformation and deformation of it when they represent it as you know timeless mastery to be admired or bought you know or ticked off you know I mean like in that film Mona Lisa where they all see a Jackson Pollock and the model of it that's being taught is ah as if you're in the in the presence of something whereas actually it's very you know I've just spent the whole year last year writing a book about how to to imagine difference in 1950s New York painting in ways in which we do not produce that effect, but come out of it with something of understanding of the possibilities of painting that were the product of that renewal in that moment. So what is the act of creation? Not as this, you know, a fetishized creator and event, but a process. So I think we can teach with all of the things that, we have um, the last 40 years have introduced of, but they ha we have to be able to teach them in that level of complexity and difficulty, rather than in a sense to be um, marked down for being, you know, you know, Professor Pollock's classes are incomprehensible. Maybe they are because I'm a terrible teacher, but my job is to be able to understand where they're at and where I can find the bridges to enable them to see how the issues that, that literally tear their bodies apart can meet with why you need to think like as, as heavily as this. So if, if, if you were to teach this, to, this essay to teachers and hoping that teachers would get something from it, and then you were to teach it to students and hoping students would get something from it. 
how would you teach it differently? Because it seems to me, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about the essay that you, you pointed to is that she really does make a somewhat unique argument in her work in this essay that education has to be, in a sense, cordoned off from the rest of the political world, right? In the political world, we treat each other as adults. We treat each other as, as, as equals. Um, and we treat each other uh, um, as, as people who we have to listen to. Um, she really does think the educational world is one of inequality, uh, where the educator has to approach the students as the teacher with a certain authority. And that even though authority has been lost in the world, we have to, in a sense, almost make believe that it continues to exist in education in order to teach yeah, well. But I mean, she, she, she argues that the authority comes from not your position as an adult, no. but by, from the specific nature of what it is you have in sense studied and thought about, which puts you in a position. So um, I, I see that Bracha is- more, Let me just, finish, that, don't, let me just yeah. finish this point because I mean, I see with Bracha, which is there, which is for, for years and years and years, Bracha and I sort of, um, or at least I, so I studied with Bracha for years and years and years because she would come and, uh, you know, present work, uh, particularly she was evolving her theory to, to my students, my graduate students, etc. cetera. Uh, and what method of it was close reading, which was saying, here's a text. And there's all sorts of things in that text that acquire a different set of knowledges that you don't yet have. So if you read it blind, you'll just think it doesn't make any sense. But within the process of working through a text and elaborating it, you introduce them to to elements which form and you know ways that open windows to things etc and and my function was in a sense to build bridges because i knew where they were at because i worked with them to say this is a bridge you can come from this island that you're on to this new island that you've never inhabited before but there is a connection you may have to do a bit of work on it but i think you know to 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 make the connection but the sense of of what one's doing between um, the creativity of of high level thought original thought new kind of thinking and the student is not is can be mediated right because what you have as a teacher is a sense of where the students are at what the world they inhabit the normality of their work and these novel areas and how you build pathways not everybody's going to make the same bridging right it's not a matter of dumping something on that but I think it's it's not a matter of teaching this text to teachers and students it's a matter that this text is about what happens in this point of these spaces of encounter where authority is there not in the person of the teacher which is the caricature we have in movies and, and stories but in terms of your capacity to be somebody who can teach, which is to understand where people are, what will be strange in what you're teaching, how you might build that bridge through their experience to something where they already, their knowledge is mobilized and their mind is taken to another level of thinking through it. I'm are there if, if anyone in the panel wants to 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 interrupt and ask questions i'm happy to do that i'm also happy to continue uh, uh, Lindsay, i see you have a a hand up yes you can Hi. so the way we're going to do this just so everyone in the webinar knows is we'll have a conversation a bit with the panel and griselda and then as if you have questions in the webinar you can type them in in the q a and i will be able to uh read them and present them to griselda go ahead Lindsay. hi, Hi. hello everyone Rosella, thank you. That was um, a brilliant exposition and and um, very moving exposition. And it really helped me. I mean, I came back to this essay after a long time and I thought I didn't like it. Um, but your sense of how it spoke to the present um, really um, under, underscored um, for me 
how timely in the kind of past and present sense this essay is and, and how brilliant it is. I just want to put two things in the mix. Um, the one is, because I know Roger has written very brilliantly about this too, is the Little Rock essay, which, she, which she's writing, that comes out of this essay in some time, which is a response to the call for desegregation and Elizabeth Eckford's um, heroic in a lot of people's um, mind and, um, and, and the Little Rock um, um, Eight's um, heroic um, campaign to be given an education. Arendt uh, made the same argument, and I you know that, that she makes in this essay, which is to say that is an error um, that should not happen. This is regrettable, this is torturous because education should be out, kept out of the political in that sense and kept out of social, social management in that sense. And I, I don't want to go on and ruin the seminar by talking about it a lot, but it, you know, it is, it, you know, the, the response to that essay is to say, you can't keep politics out of education because in the case of segregation, in the case of race, it's already there. And that was a point that a lot of people made at the same time and why she got that so wrong. So I just want to put as the question is, what is the limit? Where are we on? What is the political limit on that boundary between the political and education. That's one thing. And then I would really love to hear you because you, uh, that, that quote at the end is one of my favorite quotes from Arendt. So the education is the point where you decide whether you love the world. Enough to take, and the key word there, which is the word I'd like to hear you speak more about, is responsibility. Because that, that again, looks forward to the work on thinking. It looks forward to Eichmann, but it also seems to be such a, a key word responsibility in the latter part of this essay and a key word that's really notably strikingly absent in political and social discussions we're having about education today. Thank you, Lindsay. Those are two fabulous questions. Um, um, just hold on to it, responsibility and Little Rock. Okay. Um, I think Arendt would contest the idea that politics is already there in education. I think she would probably argue, um, and going back to the essay in one sense, is um, the politicization of education occurred in so far as there was a policy of segregation of education, right? So yes, it's already there, but in one sense, what we um, would see in a policy of forced desegre desegregation without the transformation of those articulations of racism in the society as a whole would be to make those children who had to make that walk and go into those classes the um to to limit to disempower them from education even as you think you're going to give it the education because if you don't reconstruct it in the sort of whole complicated way she's talking about, you leave those children, which we now know happens. I mean, we hear it constantly in England. I listen to, um, you know, endless programs where now leading figures from the Asian communities or from the, you know, uh, black communities, the African communities, Caribbean communities in Britain, talk about the intense bullying they experienced at school and how the difficulty of accessing an education in so far as that exists. So we might say, oh, we want to get rid of it by having integrated education. Yes, but in terms of the reality of what looks like non-racially separated education, the, 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 what she, I was saying, the articulations of race and class and gender and sexuality already happen. So for instance, we've struggled for women to be able to go to, you know, to mix schools. We just had a huge crisis in March this year where something like 80% of young women in mixed schools dis described forms of sexual abuse that they endure in school um, from you know, having their trousers pulled down, you know, having their bodies felt up to you know, casual rape at parties, right? This, this indicates we have the, the school quite social institution is still riven with these elements of it, but what that is because of the sister society, not because, you know, so education is, is not separate from them, but in a sense, the politics of education she's refusing is more in the sign of, you know, you know, the, 
the kind of formal uh, materials which we give to. So sort of, you know, the kind of sexist and racist books that people used to produce, et cetera. So I, I, that's, that's how I, I understand that the, her, her objection to Little Rock, because it makes the child the bearer or the actual physical body and mind that has to endure the attempt to re-engineer in a society that has not itself undertaken the work to make that child simply a child who is that is free to learn, right? I mean, and I think psychologically that the, the negotiation, the daily negotiation of sexism and racism, anti-Semitism, all these other things, that, and, and transphobia in schools is we, we leave, I mean, schools we always used to think about intense is, you know, when the teachers are there, it's a jungle. Right. Every one of us who's been through an education system knows you are left on your own at the mercy of whoever forms a sort of mini power system. So I don't know, that's, that's a little bit of a rambling answer on it. Going on to your question of responsibility, um, I'm not sure, um, I suspect you're a much better person, Lindsay, to talk about that in terms of much more profound thinking through um, Arendt's kind of political uh, theories and, and, and those elements of it. But responsibility is obviously the um, kind of negotiation that, that Arendt is make, making to find a way between what we would nowadays call activism, which would be issue-based commitment to, to, to doing something, and responsibility is a kind of um, in one sense, an ethical obligation to think through and understand and grasp the sense that we are co-creators of a common world. So it's not that you are specific responsibility, but a critique of the absence of that recognition, of being part of it, which isn't like saying, you know, you should be a political activist and you've got to be in a campaign, et cetera. It's not, it's never dedicated to something that limits the political to a practice or a slogan or a position or a, a, you know, an advocacy. Because responsibility must involve, um, as it were, the dialogue, you know, the dialogue of thought, which has that larger picture in terms of what these concepts of a common human world are. And what the study of totalitarianism provides us with is how, how was this abolished? So even in a simple sense, it's abolished if you simply say, well, the Jews aren't part of our world. Now that could lead to a sort of a, an act, but it's at the level of full responsibility you know, as opposed to individuals who did say, okay, I'll sacrifice everything to save somebody. I will not be part of it. I'll leave the country. I'll risk my life to save somebody. Those are ethical acts, but responsibility requires us to not let any part of the common world be um, allowed not to be loved as part of it. And I think that's where this question of love is so interesting because love of the world, I know there's a huge, huge literature because it comes out of her, her kind of study of St. Augustine, but she turns it into something uh, which I think is very pertinent for our moment at this, as, a, as a language, as a metaphor for both the, the social and political horrors that we are still untransformed and in fact this cataclysmic sense, which is when we get to the final essay or when she says, don't try and go to space. The only earth on which human beings you know, have ever emerged is this earth. It's a kind of absolute wonderful essay for the um, planetary times. And that would be responsibility, which is, and in the present pandemic, it takes up this whole debate we have about who should wear masks, right? Who should, you know, not do things? What is it to have responsibility for the common world is a concept that is very difficult in societies of extreme individualism and concepts of freedom, which are, you know, not Arendtian concepts of freedom to act, to renew and transform, but perhaps to harm. Right. I just was also wondering, then I'll be quiet, if it is possible to join the two up, because I don't think 
I think oh, you're absolutely right in your description of school social health um, and the kind of political health is, is absolutely bang on and, 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 and it sends shivers up my spine to recall it. But the answer to that cannot be segregation. <laughs> the answer to that, can, I don't think, it cannot be um, to separate the sexes. But the responsibility yeah, must the, come. Yeah, the the, must, the responsibility must come, and this is political, about giving educators the authority back to be responsible for the people they're looking, they're loving, yeah. they're educating. And I think that's where the political debate has to happen, particularly in the UK. I mean, it's, it's slightly different in the, U, in the US, but in the UK where you know, education is both totally socialised and totally political, and yet nobody in education is allowed to have any authority. And that, I think, is why students feel so... Um, hopeless and traumatized by an education system that keeps on running along the old mill whilst being told, you know, whilst being educated into new ideas and that kind of structural sense of structural racism, structural sexism, crashing into a kind of thinking around it, you know, enlightened thinking or thinking of difference is unbearable. But the problem with being a teacher is you're, or, 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 or as someone who is, you know, is running education is you are not allowed have the authority to love properly yeah but that's systemic right yeah. precisely because potential for education to be transformative and obviously was undertaken by labor movements working class struggles for education black struggles for education women's struggle for education believed that if only they could have access to this stuff this would enable them to be so to be members of the societies but the societies have found ways to stop us being what we thought we were getting education education would be our road to Right. So I think we were we're false. We're wrong to think that education is somehow not managing it. It's systemic. I mean, we just had our A level results in this country, which shows that, you know, 70 percent of children in private education got fantastic you know, results and sort of 30 percent of children in public in, in you know, what you call public schools in, in you know, in, in, in state run schools didn't. I mean, they, 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 we are education is so you know, structured. I mean, there's a wonderful work by by. Um, Paul Willis, a great cultural studies analyst called Learning to Labor, which explained exactly how the, un, the, ref, the de education of working class white kids was producing fodder to go into the factories, that the alienation of young men from education in this, this is, it's a systemic. And I think this de, the destruction, you did not live to see the destruction of teacher authority, but you don't have teacher authority now because you don't have that structure in which this is this education is conceived of as this space of encounter it's delivering a service which is monitored and things but it is you know in the interest of contemporary capitalism not to allow this and i think the evidence of separate education for women and i suspect indeed in in the history of um all black colleges it means you can walk into a room and be john or mary or Stuart or you know Able, whatever, rather than to be walk in and be a black student or a woman student. So I, th I think it's an interesting debate. I don't have a view on it, but I think obviously segregation, no, but actually spaces of safety to learn might well be an, a different issue, which I think we haven't resolved. I'm not sure entirely how those two are different. I mean, obviously, in intent, they can be. But um, I think the question of responsibility, it might be helpful to take a look at page 186 in the, in the edition, the second edition of Between Past and Future, um, in the paragraph where Arendt begins, in education, this responsibility for the world takes the form of authority. And um, you know, this, this really does connect responsibility which in the paragraph that Lindsay and Griselda have been talking about is, is, is talked about, you have to love the world enough to take, to assume responsibility for it. And now we're told that in education, responsibility for the world takes the form of authority. And the authority comes not from qualifications alone, not from the person, not from personal authority, not from qualifications alone, although that's important, but from, um, the teacher's qualification consists in knowing the world and being able to instruct others about it. That's the qualification. But his authority or her authority or their authority 
rests on their assumption of responsibility for that world. And I do think, and, and this, is, um, this is a difficult part of our end, and I, but I think it's important. I do think that the authority and responsibility um, that a teacher takes is loving the world as it is. Now, that doesn't mean that if you live in a world where there's racism, you love racism per se, but it does mean that you love the world with racism in it. Just like for Arendt, her struggle was to love the world that could have produced the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And she affirmed that she did love that world and to love and, 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 and what she believes is that to teach you have to teach people that the world is as it is, that it changes. That it, and, then, and that's the sentence that follows what Lindsay and Griselda were reading on 193, that education is the point where we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it and, and by the same token, save it from that ruin which would come except for renewal, except for the young who will change it. If the world stays the same and we change and new people are born, we'll destroy the world because we'll come to see it as unjust. But we have to be able to love it and also welcome its change and its renewal. And, um, and, and that's what puts teachers, I think, in a tough position today or you know, in all times. But I think especially today where teachers want not only, not, I mean, and this Griselda talked about with assessment, want to be loved by their students. That's not in our end's view. And I think in my view as well, that's not a healthy attitude for a teacher. A teacher's not there to be loved by their students. They're there to be respected by their students, but not loved by them. Could I and, ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. It seems to me that there's a big difference between talking constantly about school in the English sense of the word, i.e. pre-university, and education and teaching and teacher-student relationships a little bit later on. Uh, and, and this text by Arendt, whose contemporaneity obviously strikes me, whose use of the word love obviously strikes me with all the richness we've been discussing. I'd just like to just throw in one or two things about what was happening when she was actually writing because uh, which I'm sure she would have engaged with if someone had thrown them up and asked her to talk about them at the time but I mean first of all she doesn't mention it she doesn't Im imply that child psychology and child psychoanalysis exists as disciplines secondly one thing I think is very interesting in terms of how horrible everyone is when left to their own devices and or children is 54, of course, once again, we don't quite know, but you do know when precisely this was first published. 54 is the publication of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. 55 is the first New York publishing of Huizinger's Homo Ludens, Man as a Playing Animal, although it was published in English in 49. And more particularly, in terms of 61, that's when the school mathematics project was first um, uh, published and started to be um, infiltrating the educational system, which was a new and more playful and less didactic and authoritarian way of teaching maths at the moment of computers and, um, and Sputnik. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. There is some kind of funny Sputnik and programming connection. And I, for example, I was taught at school, a school mathematics project, which was trying to get away precisely from authoritarian maths teaching. So that I think that once again, as you know, my, I'm a very, very wicked person because I always feel that uh, Arendt's rhetoric is marvelous and very much of its time and very much about her, but there's always a kind of o tempora o mores element in it, which, you know, which, and, and 62 is the moment of Thomas Kuhn's paradigm change. So in a way she is, 
not wanting to take on the possibility of paradigm changes. And of course, the education, I, have, I was very lucky and privileged in my education, I entirely admit. But the fact that curricula were opening up, history was being taught in new ways with children doing projects and things. The fact that it's all become much, much more authoritarian now is, is a backlash to that. And she's also writing, you know, if, if we take 61, just before 68, when in universities in France, they started instigating a relationship of friendship and also tutoiement in universities, calling your teacher to and not vous, as if you like a social and learning experiment. And I do think her text is poised on the cusp or almost like on the, not wanting to fall, you know, to fall into the into this experimental arena, even if now things have changed very negatively and in a very authoritarian way. And everything we've said about the relevance of the work for the present is true. I do think that that 60s moment and the possibility of what was opening up should not. I mean, I do think the, the titles I've mentioned, including the way that Lord of the Flies is a throwback you know, to the concentrationary universe, if you like. But I do think that that moment of the 50s and 60s should be taken into consideration. You know, as a, a, it's not Manichaean, it's not saying one is good, one is bad, but as, as a kind of fizzing context around what she's saying. That's all I wanted to say, but, um, you know, taking you back into the moment when she wrote it, not into the meanings for the present. Sarah, that's that's a that's a really great point, and and it is one of those things to do with a kind of a, um, a perfectly legitimate model of research is to try and track, as it were, the the intellectual context um, in which Arendt is is working. At the same time, in sense, the published texts are the product of a particular selection for the purposes that I'm trying to put forward is that you have to read them as this part of this trilogy or this uh, yeah, of quartet course, of yeah. books in which for her the question of our of the time was evil you know she declares this right rarely you know in 44 45 mm -hmm. this that this is the question of what happens when as it were you know we, uh, basically in a sense the in the the crimes against humanity which of course, we then wish to say, okay, well, how, you know, she, her uh, blindness to some of the crimes of humanity in terms of enslavement, uh, as, as in instance, that, that instance, a, a, even a more foundational and vast crime that's whose effects are still being worked out, such as so. I mean, there are, there are blind spots, there are limitations, there are focuses, there are things, etc. And all of the things you're talking about are to do with, in a sense, shifts which we now have to make sense of in terms of the notion of the psychology of the child or you know, Winnicott's playing in reality and the whole question of, of play and stuff. And clearly she's not talking about everybody having to go to school with their kind of you know, notepads and doing things. We, we can have to extrapolate from it. What is it that would constitute preserving the possibility of transmission in this kind of abstracted world that she's putting of the two generations or the multiple generations coexisting in, in a shared world which, for which everyone has responsibility, which enables the young, the newcomers, children and young people, she uses these two different categories for elementary school and obviously high in, in university, to be enabled to act. This doesn't mean, and I go back to Roger, your point, I don't think renewal is the same as change. Because I think that would then get us into this notion which we suffer from now, which is you can't be the same as the previous generation. You have to react against it, right? It's one of the things I'm trying to think through with this notion of feminism as a bad memory, the cultural memory of feminism that is being inscribed by feminists and within our own things as well as outside of it is completely destructive as it has been. And it's going to force a new kind of forgetfulness of a, a, a shared responsibility for a continual work. Right, so I think it's not that you put her back into her context and then we'll see it, right? And I don't think she is going to escape any of the criticisms that people can make of Arendt's vision, her narrowness and her, her about certain big questions, um, you know, and indeed as a sort of 
um, one of the things in the book on Hannah Arendt and education was very interesting is one of the things that her concept of the parvenu and the pariah arising out of the very detailed study of European Jewry in its attempt to become part of modern Western European societies, how that resonates in a very um, uh, multicultural uh, sort of classroom in, Los in, in California, where some one of the, the people who are writing is talking about how these different concepts arising from something where she is narrowed in her vision to this object that has been the event that shattered her world, become available to be tools to be thought with, right? So I don't want to confine her to some, you know, how do we understand the origins of her thinking? I think we all know the a lot of the limitations and a lot of the embarrassments and the limits, but what is it we take from it, which comes back to this question as to, um, not in a sense curriculum, and it's going back to Roger's thing, exactly this point, which is, if this is a, a space, a, a common world, it is about relations between already formed people and becoming people. And it's not because the becoming people are going to make changes, this endless notion that you have to do something different. It's renewal, right? And renewal is a very much more diff difficult thing than, than constant change. It may be genuine creation, but creation isn't just to create the new, it creates something that is going to sustain or expand what is called the, the human world. And the human world then has to understand what is the human world? Not because we're just all humans because we're born, we're not. We're born into a world that has humanized itself by being made into which we could act. And so the action and responsibility come together. And it's not this search for constant novelty, which is why this question of, you know, where Roger started with, you know, when we taught people the canon, you stuck them to a certain hypostasized moment of whoever thought this was the canon. It and it wasn't actually the address the teaching of evil or the teaching of the Holocaust, which, as you know, was a, a, a very, very big and difficult issue, for example, in Germany, and certainly wasn't taught when I was at school, and is certainly one of the things where you actually teach these new people about evil. I mean, bizarrely enough, obviously the Victorians were much better at teaching people about evil when there was some uh, system in which, um, I'm just talking about, you know, Christian precepts. I'm not talking about what they were actually doing at the time. I'm not making some, yeah, I'm trying not to say something trite and stupid, but what I'm saying is that um, the problem of teaching the badness, uh, you know, to these new people, at what stage, I mean, I had a completely apolitical education at school and at university and at the Courtauld Institute of Art. So, I mean, at what stage, in as much as she comes from that knot of evil, it informs her thinking and her trilogy, at what stage will she, well, will the question of the teaching of the problem of evil to new peoples be addressed? If we took it in terms of the present arguments about decolonization and awareness of issues in relation to the histories of enslavement, part of it is what I'm saying at the beginning, which is it has to be named, right? What, it, what in, you know, naming it and naming it as a crime in her terms, in terms of the evil, is a crime for which there is no existing theological or legal definition. It exceeds them. So it's not a matter of bad people. No, no, right? no. I'm just and it's not, I mean, it's, not, it's, it's something, that... therefore, that requires us to think through the complexity of what it constitutes that then can, by being named, not simply be accusatory, because in a sense, we've, we've come into a situation now where um, language is, 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 you know, naming other people, fix them to positions in this drama of what has happened in the past, not into um, encounters by means of which, I think one of them, Natasha Levinson talks about this in a book about, you know, um, Hannah Arendt going to Germany and saying, you know, I can come as a Jew and a German and a friend, right? This is not impossible. 
if we have a concept of the common world. But what is made impossible is precisely because of the persistent articulations and enactments in the irresponsibility of innate of sustaining systems. Now, aren't you know, I'm a much more of a Marxist than Arendt ever was, and much more of a systemic, you know, pointing to systemic structures. I think you can't do without Marx as a contribution to understanding how systemic systems work, um, which get us out of this notion that evil is, you know, is a theological evil or a, you know, or a demonic evil or a, an evil that law can counter, right? I mean, thou shalt not kill, also, you shan't, can't kill people and keep them alive by depriving them of humanity. That's enslavement. This and this is not. This is a, you know, in a sense, a, 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 in a sense, an evil that we that has not been, you know, named and accounted for. We just tick and embarrassingly, but it is something which has to ha has to be transformed in the situation where the descendants of, you know, white descendants of anybody who was part of the European system that did this is still has to be part of the restoring of the world, the renewing of the world. I think that 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 is my my sense of what Arendt did is not in a sense to teach people about the Holocaust and also she's not really talking about the Holocaust. She is talking about the the, the totalitarian system in which the possibility of enslavement and racialized genocide happened, could happen. And that's my, my key point is we have to think the concentrationary separate from the genocidal and then begin to see how it enables us to think the kinds of societies we create, which racism is a, a concentrationary society because it confines people, limits them, to operate, to limit their capacity for freedom and action and human humanness. We've got about five minutes left um, and there's a bunch of questions and comments in the chat. Um, I've, been, I've been looking at them as we go along. There's one from, I don't know if there's one particular you want to address, Griselda? Um, you, no, you choose for me what you think. Well, I mean, there's a few. Uh, Susan Wright asks, um, what does a rent, um, what would it, uh, um, I'm sorry, I thought, I thought she'd ask, oh, it's in their second question. She writes, she asks, um, you can't keep children in a bubble, right? What would it mean to, uh, in a sense, um, protect them from the world? Take, um, take back the edu curriculum from the state. Um, I mean, in one sense, um, I feel as if I'm drowning quietly in the pool that you see behind me because of the huge complexity. And my purpose is not to put myself forward as someone who has answers to the um, issues of education so much as to understand in a sense why she saw this as a, why she's thought the crisis of education is a crisis of politics. Right, of course you can't keep children from the politics and you, you know, the, um, any curriculum that we would come up with would already be in a sense, I keep saying, already an articulation of various ways that, of thinking which shape the, the world we're in. The struggle obviously that we've had through feminism and through um, various forms of transformation, post-colonial, decolonizing, all the rest of it, which are, 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 are very urgent are not a matter of someone else telling us what our curriculum should be. I take it very personally and I've done it. We had a, a movement in my school where a number of students of color said, you know, have really taken on this and, are, and they called it buyer's remorse and her whole program. And one of the things that I try to uh, explore in terms of rethinking my own teaching practice is when I have been confronted by students I have felt an obligation to transform my teaching to no longer persist. I can't say I don't know. I can't say I wasn't trained to do this. I am trained to be a scholar. I'm trained to find things out. I am trained to expand my field of understanding. I am capable of research and understanding. I can and must immediately make changes. The changes are to prevent the students from the affliction of being lonely in my classrooms. 
So if students are students of color or students uh, in, in terms of sexuality or particularly the vast majority are women who find themselves lonely in the classroom because what they're being taught speaks not of resources for them to be part of the common world, but only of other people, then I have afflicted my students. I have deprived them. I mean, that seems to me where you say you take responsibility is you take up the obligations yourself in that moment to transform the terms of their experience by the knowledge or the understanding or the resources you, you engage with them, which involves you in continuous transformation. I'm not st st still just teaching what I know. That's what, you know, that's what keeps this kind of, you know, white male curriculum in place, right? But I'm as much a newcomer to my subject all the time. I have that capacity to go on learning, right? But it's an obligation to facilitate their education, not to tell them what to think, not to tell them politically correct things to think, not to be politically correct myself, but to resource them in such a way that they are not, you know, and this is true for, for children of working class families, children from immigrant families, Jewish from Jewish families, you know, much fewer numbers in our country and they come, they experience, being lonely and isolated in the dominant system, right? And that is dis disempowers them from, edu from participating in education. So that is, I think, a very simple thing. I'm not protecting them from politics. I'm not asking for a state curriculum telling it. You negotiate and work it out. But once you are called out on it, you are obligated to transform yourself, to imagine what is the common world that would make all the students in this classroom, as it were, not experience the isolations, the loneliness, the exclusions, sort of imaginative as well as real exclusions that are the performance of race, class, gender, sexuality, race, all these things. I think it's just a work at, in at progress. At the same time, um, and I agree with, with what you've said, Griselda, I find it very moving. It's also a mistake to protect your students from the world by simply teaching them what they want or what will make them comfortable or happy because that's not teaching them the world. Absolutely. Uh, no, part, absolutely. Part of the world is teaching them things that are new to them. Not, and just like you have to expand yourself, your job as an authority or as a teacher is to teach them what's new to them, the oldness of the world. And, uh, and so that's the that's the dance that has to be danced as we develop these curriculum. There are a lot of more questions, and there's also hands up, and yet we're out of time. Um, but uh, I take that as a as a as a sign that this was a good conversation, and um, that everyone uh, always you want to leave leave them wanting more, right, Griselda? Um, so uh, I want to thank Griselda and uh, for, for a great uh, leading of this discussion of Hannah Arendt's The Crisis in Education. Thank all the panelists. Thank Julia and Richard for uh, hosting us. Richard, do you want to come in and say a farewell? Yes, I just want to thank you, Roger. Griselda, fantastic. That was a riveting one and a half hours. And um, we have to find a way to um, to answer all the unanswered questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Griselda. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for host, inviting Brilliant. me to be um, to be part of your incredible conversation. You'll see me. You won't see me because I'll go back into being in the audience now. But uh, I, I'm really delighted to be here and see all these lovely faces. Wonderful. Um, Vivian is still so keen to do something, but send me a message, Vivian. Yeah, Vivian, I mean, can you get in touch with Griselda? Because we're, 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 no, we're absolutely. past our time. Yes, of course. Um, we'll see you all when we have the next discussion of crisis and culture. And uh, look forward to seeing you then. Be well. Take care. Right. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Griselda. Thanks.